Digital 410 Media proudly presents the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast with your hosts, Don Abernathy, Jeff Copsetta, and Dennis Blocker. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast, your favorite World War II based podcast. And we are back for this month of February. Jeff is not with us tonight, but it's going to be me and Dennis Blocker. And we're going to start episode one of a two part episode on Iwo Jima, plus much, much more. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to disperse, we're going to interject, we're going to play, we're going to include, if you will, um, tidbits from an interview I did a while back, actually back in 2020, so not too long ago, with World War II vet Robert Glenn of Fox Company, 2nd Battalion of the 3rd Marines. He fought from Bougainville, Guam, and Iwo Jima. So we thought, what better time to disperse some of his live experiences of what he went through on Iwo Jima than on this podcast episode talking about Iwo Jima. Mr. Blocker, how are you doing tonight, sir? Doing great. Doing really good. Excited to be here. Happy to hear. Happy to hear. How's how's life in Texas right now? Good. Beautiful weather. Yeah, everything is green, so it's a lot different than it is up north. It's, this winter time is when it's green for us. This is um, probably the second longest winter I've dealt with in Florida since I've been down here, and I moved down here in 2004. Um today and yesterday was probably the third time i've had my air conditioning on since november so it's oh. been crazily cold down here <laughs> it was funny i was going to the store the <laughs> other day and i often joke that i'm just a i'm a floridian who surfs from one climate controlled environment to the next so i'm in my office <laughs> to my car to my car to a store to a store to my house unless i'm fishing or running but through the, the work day, so a lot of times I have a hooded sweatshirt on. Like, we keep my office, like, at 63 at the office. But I was on lunch break and I had a sweatshirt on, and it was it was a cool 72. Now, people who live up in Ohio and New York who's dealing with 20-degree weather, like, what the hell's a cool 72? But you being a Texan, you know when the humidity goes away, 72 can yeah. be a mite chilly. Because, after all, right, we're lizard exactly. people. and That's hoodie weather. <laughs> we're lizard people in our bloodstone. <laughs> I was walking into a uh, Ross... Uh, outlet store because I, I heard you can get hokas or brooks running shoes there for super cheap and i've been doing a hell of a lot of running and i'm walking into the store with my adidas hoodie on and it's a cool 72 and i see some clearly snowbirds walking out because the mom had on just a <laughs> bikini top bikini bottoms with like that little sash that you wear around your bottom when you're out in public so these guys were clearly from like minnesota and they were on their way to the beach <laughs> meanwhile all of us locals got on hooded sweatshirts and sock hats and sweatpants and uggs and all that crap it's like <laughs> yeah, we're lizard people. You think you're tough, but come down here in August, you'll be dying, and I'll have on a pair. Yeah, of, exactly. I'll have on a pair of jeans and a and a long sleeve shirt, and I'll be just fine. So mm-hmm. I'm happy to see. Um, real quick, I posted on our page today, and we, I know it's not World War II, but this this particular case it is. So I've been getting back into my running. I did a 5K two weeks ago. Um, it's the first 5k nice. I've done since 2021. Not the first time I ran five. And every time I run three to four nights a week. And every time I run, I run a minimum of three miles unless I'm beat. Then I just push a mile and a half. But it's the first race registered race I've done since 2021, which was the public run for the arts, which happens to be the first registered race I had ever ran back in 2019. Cause I wanted to see, okay, let's see how slow I've gotten since I've gotten older and took two years off, had some injuries and gotten fat. <laughs> and so I was five minutes slower than I was uh, in 2019 when I ran it, but I came in third place in my age group. Nice, nice. thing about getting old is fewer, fewer people sign up for races. And so <laughs> I was third place out of seven people in my age group. But, hey, it's not my fault everybody else is sitting on their ass. But the reason I bring that up, I'm not a huge fan of virtual races because they're essentially just buy a medal and I'll send it to you in the mail. But this cool one came across my Facebook page today, and you – you pay for it, but you have to send them proof that you did the miles through an app. 80 miles. You got four months to do it, but it's a European company, and it's the 80, 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings. And the medal, oh, wow. the medal actually is D-Day, and it has, it has Normandy map in the background. It says 80th anniversary of D-Day. And so I went ahead and signed up for it. And you can download the map, and as you log your miles, it'll show you from the landing beaches. Now, clearly, it's not going to be 100% accurate historically, but it'll show you walking, you know, through the the primary battlefields, you know, of the D-Day landings. And so I thought, well, that's right in my eye. I'm always looking for motivation to run. And what a cool medal to actually add to my 
my medals over here. It's it's a very cool medal. It says D-Day right on it. You guys can see the photo on what's the scuttlebutt.com and uh, the Facebook page. But while we're talking about it, when you head over to what's the scuttlebutt.com or our Facebook page to check out that link, head on over to Patreon or simply click on the Patreon link on the what's the scuttlebutt.com website. Sign up and subscribe. It's a dollar a month. There's a seven dollar a month plan as well as a three dollar and fifty cents a month plan. If you sign up for the seven dollar a month plan, you can get a cool shirt after your second month, like the one Dennis is wearing, which is our OG What's the Scuttlebutt logo. For those of you with a keen eye, I am wearing a reproduction Navy jacket tonight because, you know, Navy never gets enough play. Um, you could also <laughs> choose from our What's the Scuttlebutt logo that has the Lucky Strike on it or the new one with the guy carrying a mug. Or, as we said last episode, That's cool. you can get a hat. You want a hat instead of a shirt because you're like me. Maybe you'll wear a hat more. Maybe you got enough shirts. Um, you're more than welcome to get the What's the Scuttlebutt hat. Hell, I'll put it out there if you want two mugs, basically – Two mugs, roughly the price of a hat or T-shirt. Anything basically essentially the same value. So I'll reach out to you on Patreon and say, hey, it's been two months. You want a shirt? You want a hat? What do you want? And we'll we'll get you situated. But more important than that, the next upcoming Patreon giveaway, we're giving away this guy from Valor Studios. It's wow. the Marine Corps. It's autographed. Coming off That's of, so I think beautiful. it's Pelaloo. Both Jeff and I have wow. one. Uh, the cool thing about this, yes, this is from Valor Studio. It's a few years old. I will say, put this caveat, there are some imperfections to it, but the reason there's imperfections to it is this was actually sitting in the home office of one Henry Sledge since they came out originally back when the program came out. And that one is That's signed cool. by Henry as well. So not only will you get the print, not only is it signed by Henry, but it's basically sat in his basement for 10 years. So there's that. It's a little extra value you can only get here at the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast. And if you haven't done so, please head over to YouTube. Look for D410 Media. That's D410 Media. You can find the What's the Scuttlebutt, all our shows. You can find some of our World War II videos I've done at the reenactments, my fishing content, et cetera, et cetera. Jeff will be back next week. But we're going to dive right into it, and we're going to let Dennis kick this one off. We're going to go Iwo Jima and that period. Yeah, so uh, the LCI gunboats. You know, LCI stands for Lousy Civilian Idea, um, 150 feet long, flat bottomed, ocean going. So they would leave San Diego and head to Pearl. And they did that flat bottom the whole way, uh, cork in the water. Uh, now, the guys that I interviewed, uh huh. That's first off, let's talk about resources. What a tremendous waste of gas. Um, <laughs> Some of you guys know I'm a kayak fisherman. My first kayak was just a basic lifetime Teton 100 kayak. Very, very minimum keel, kind of flat bottom. Any wind ever set to 10 mile an hour would push me around. Paddling, not very efficient. The bigger the waves, that flat bottom is. Now I, a couple years later, got a Vibe Yellowfin 120. Has a nice keel, has a rudder. That thing goes straight. The amount of diesel fuel <laughs> they had to waste. It was brutal. It was brutal. Now, for the, the uninitiated, because I see this all the time, I was actually a little, doing a little show prep, watching a great um, History Channel episode um, on Iwo Jima. A lot of Korean actors in there. But they're talking about Higgins boats, and then they show an LCI. I was like, that's not a Higgins boat. That's a So for the uninitiated, what's the difference between a landing craft and LCI, the different variants of boats, the alligators, and all of our landing crafts. So let's let's start there for the new to the um, world of um, amphibious landing, if you will. Sure. So yeah, the uh, the the LCVP is what we would you know everybody knows that one as far as if they've seen Saving Private Ryan. When you think of the troops hitting the beach, pretty much everyone just automatically assumes that's what you're talking about. So it got very famous with that movie, of course. Essentially made um, out of white pine and some paint <laughs> and a diesel engine. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, just, you know, put troops on the beach, ramp comes down, run off, raise the ramp and back out and do it all over again, hopefully. Um, so when I heard that my, my grandfather was on an LCI, that's immediately what I thought it was. It was the uh, what would turn out to be the LCVP. But um, research... I found out that no, it actually, uh, the LCI was 150 feet long. It was an ocean-going craft. 
it had its had a complement of officers. Uh, like in the beginning, there was three officers. Then it went up to seven. The gunboats, when they were converted into gunboats, but uh, yeah, they were 150 feet long, about 25 feet wide. They had a bow, um, and they later models had a almost like an LST front where the ramp would come down at the front. But you know, for the most part, they all had these ramps that were that would extend out by pulley. And then they would drop down onto the beach, and then the, uh, they would each hold about a company of troops, and then they would file out. And uh, that's what they did on Normandy. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there were uh, five LCIs lost on Omaha Beach, um, but uh, that's their function was to land troops. And what was the payload when, on those? Because obviously a Higgins boat is personnel only, but the LCIs could carry jeeps. And smaller, heavy equipment. The, the, the ones that came in later that had the bow door, yes, absolutely. But you know, other than that, no, it was just strictly for I infantry. Um, and then, you know, because of Beccio Island and, and uh, Tarawa, you know, when they, they they went in, the Marines went in. They had information, famously bad information, um, and they had to wade in water up to, to their waist and up to their chest in some places and that's agonizingly slow going and they were just mowed down by the hundreds um that in connection with the bad information revealed to them that what they needed was they needed they needed real time they needed real time information on what was going on with you they could no longer were they going to just trust these old dodgy uh charts from british sailors from decades before now they were I think they actually use for Guadalcanal I think they used maps out of a Jack London novel. <laughs> no lie. I think wow. I think I remember that. Yeah. Cuz and and for you know that that whole necessity gave birth to what we know now as the Navy SEALs. And that back then they were called underwater demolition teams, the UDT frogmen and so they knew they needed those guys to go in and they had these these uh clear uh clipboards that they would have on their strapped to their leg and they would have grease pens and they'd gr mark down the grade and what the, they'd get samples of the soil and they would see like at you know at Saipan they would blow up just hundreds and hundreds of uh, feet of obstacles that the Japanese had erected and then if they would they would purposely blow channels through the coral so that the landing craft uh, could come in and deposit onto the beaches and all of that all came because of the disaster at Tarawa. And, uh, but they knew that the frogmen were going to need protection. Right? Yep. You're just not going to send these guys in. So what better ship than one that's designed to get right up in there? And that was when they had the idea to use the LCI. And they thought, well, this ship is designed to get in there. So why don't we remove the ramps? put rocket launchers all along where the ramps were and they put rocket launchers, rocket pods. And then they put, uh, they removed the 20 millimeter mount from the front, the bow, and they put on a 40 millimeter there. And they put two twenties in the well deck and back on the gun deck where the conning tower is, they removed those two twenties, moved them back towards the fantail. And in their place where they had been previously forward of the conning tower, they put two more 40 millimeter guns. And so now they had, you know, five, they had uh, four 20s, three 40s, and a full complement of 120 rockets that they could reuse. Now, each rocket was the equivalent of a five inch shell from a destroyer. So, this is significant firepower they're putting down on these beaches. And it's relatively new. I mean, oftentimes, unless you go back and watch a lot of the World War II docuseries from the 80s and 90s, we've all can visualize if you're over 30 you can visualize mm -hmm. the commercials and the black and white footage that choo, 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 choo. yeah but absolutely. if you're watching the save it private ryan's you're watching the the uh the pacific you're watching um band of brothers any modern day semi-modern day each, hell even stuff from the 80s and 90s as far as theatrical movies go you don't see the rocket launchers that much when you think world war ii rocket launchers you're thinking bazookas and Panzerfaust. you very right. rarely think of those those rigs unless you watch the old archival footage because for some reason maybe because they weren't available uh we don't never think about now we could use cgi but that those 
rockets weren't included in too many modern day motion pictures or even TV series about World War II. A lot of people forget. Oh, we we did have rockets back then. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and if you can imagine, like when you're when they're when the LCIs were going in, they would fire one. They would put it on salvo. You know, they had it on salvo and then just single. They would shoot a rocket, and that's how you measured. If, if it's short of the beach, well, then you coast in more, and then you release another one, and then it starts hitting the beach. Well, then you start, you start, you know, salvoing, and you just they start letting them go, and you're coasting in the whole time. And what you're doing is you're walking these these five inch uh, rockets um, all up the beach, but then you've got gunboats all alongside each other, you know, which was, you know, particularly at Saipan and Guam was impressive uh, to see with uh, all of those gunboats there. Uh, just letting loose. Um, people said that guys on the battleship Nevada described it as the gods tearing metal in the sky. Like it was just this, just this roar. I can imagine. Um, because a rocket but, clearly has a different footprint, a different sound than artillery. It just com- it's just exactly. a completely different monster. You have and, and and they were wondering like, what are these little pesky little ships going in? <laughs> heading into there, what are they going to do? And then all of a sudden they all opened up with their capabilities and they were just, just jaws were dropping. Um, but, so you know, because it was all very, Go ahead. you know, you think about big Navy, big Navy's uh, story is, you know, kamikaze attacks. And um, every once in a while they would get into, um, to shell some, some beaches and with whatnot. But, you know, when 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 you're thinking of the LCI gunboats, those are some scrappy crews, and they are getting right in there, and they're duking it out with uh, pillboxes, and they're they're so close at nighttime on um, at Guam that the dogs ashore were barking at them, and giving away that they were there. Um, but you know, fast forwarding to Iwo Jima, you know, LCI Flotilla Three is the is the group that my grandpa was in, and, and they had laid the groundwork. They had been uh, at uh, Kwajalein, they were at uh, Perry Island, they were all through the Marshalls, and then they went to uh, Saipan, they were at Guam, they were at Tinian, um, they were at Palau, um, Peleliu, they were at all these places, and so when it comes time to go to Iwo Jima, they, they get, they're, they're slated for it, because they have got so much experience. And what's really interesting is that when you see pictures now of the invasion of February 19th, 1945, the, the invasion with the Marines all going in in the amphibious waves, exactly. But when you see it from the air and you see from further back out at sea and you can just see this vast, you'll see gunboats there, but they're not LCIs, they're LCS. And that was something that was not most supposed to happen. Were they included? Uh, LCI... Are they included in mm-hmm. the post-invasion numbers? And here's why I bring that up. As I was saying, I was watching a docu-series before the show, and they're showing, as you just explained, the aerial view. And I'm watching, I'm like, damn, that's a shit ton of vehicles. And so first thing you do, how many landing craft were involved in the... And it said um, the landing craft that were involved, I think it was like a total of, um, I don't know, like, Oh, here we go. Um, Hill's command would include 125 in, amphibious ships and an additional 75 seagoing landing crafts. Altogether, 495 ships around Iwo Jima. But I'm not talking about the naval. I'm talking about the wave. You see this long, what looks like miles of... And I'm thinking, that looks like a hell of a lot more than 210 vessels. So I didn't yeah. know if maybe those LCIs were included in this amphibious landing craft. Because I... I I, I have to believe they're not because you go back and watch that footage and it looks like a hell of a lot more than 200 vehicles making that initial wave. Cause you can just, you can see the it's black and white. It's aerial footage, but you can see the weight coming off behind them. And it's like, that looks way more than 200 and some odd ships. So I don't know if the LCIs were included in that. I don't know. It'd be interesting yeah, to, be good, to do uh, deeper good into bit of research to do there. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick. Um, since we're kind of on the topic of pre invasion, artillery and you know laying down the groundwork we land in guadalcanal on august 7th 1942 all right and now this is february 
20, uh, February 19th, right? We landed. That's when we hit the beaches. Um, and, yeah, the, the recon mission was on the 17th. Yes, uh, but f February 19th. Um, Boots on the ground. It strikes me as, I don't want to say surprising, but after reading as much as we do, and I don't know if it's the truth, I don't know if it's lazy writing, but you always hear that once we got on the island, regardless if it was Tarawa, Peleliu, Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, they always say, we were shocked at the lack of impact and the lack of what's the word I'm looking for? Lack of effectiveness from the pre-landing invasion to say, okay, I get that for Guadalcanal, maybe Peleliu, but th by this point, <laughs> we've done a few of these. Don't we know that there are an inordinate amount of underground tunnels at this point? How can we be that shocked by the lack of effectiveness if every single invasion we've done in the Pacific, we find a lack of effectiveness in our pre-landing invasion? How are we still surprised? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a good answer for that. Yeah, you know? like I said, yeah, it could be except, just lazy writing. You know, the only on the thing I can think write... of is that those guys that might have been talking about it were just concerned about their six feet of space, and they weren't privy to the whole, the whole picture of what was going on beforehand. For instance, well, let me you know, hold on, on hold set... on. I'm sorry, let me rewind. I, I'm not saying I'm. This isn't from the first person. This is from the writings or the narration of these TV shows or these articles. Oh, the historians. You always hear the historians say. And, the, and, the, and they were caught off guard by the lack of effectiveness. It's like, yeah, I kind of feel like they're just they're just kind of repeating what other people have said, just because it's kind of popular to say that. But if you get in there and you look at the gunnery reports from Iwo Jima, which um, I had to do with, because I was, you know, researching it for with uh, Mitch Weiss, the author that we did, The Heart of Hell, about the 17th of February at Iwo Jima. I mean, there's a there's a very in depth gun uh, report of all of the uh, i mean they had it uh, don they had it so well organized mm -hmm. that 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 island was completely surrounded by battleships and cruisers and destroyers and they had it down to millimeter millimeters as far as grids and they could literally call in fire on any point and that was one of the benefits from the 17 february mission was they had been if there was a if there was a submarine coasting by Iwo Jima and he had an extra ammunition aboard and they wanted to do target practice, they'd just take a couple of pot shots at Iwo and then go on with the invasion, you know, months off. But the reality was is that when they went in on the 17th, now they 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 were surprised. They were surprised uh, at the volume of fire that the, the gunboat group received. But it turned out to be a mixed blessing because all those beady-eyed sailors aboard the destroyers and the cruisers and the battleships, they were jotting down uh, everywhere where they were seeing this weapons fire coming from. And the Tennessee, in particular, was seen to go point blank right up in there and blew these uh, artillery pieces out of the mountain, out of Mount Suribachi. And they were seen tumbling down the mountain, splashing and down into the, into the bottom. And those weren't available on the 19th. They weren't there. They weren't there. Those and by the way, Don, those those artillerists were so good and so accurate that on the four fifty gunboat, they punched the four seventy four gunboat. They punched a hole in the engine room, and then they followed it with another shot that went into that hole into the engine room and blew up. And the four seventy four uh, was lost, was sunk that day. Um, but I mean, that's how, and they were, they, they had, they had this idea that they would paint giant numbers, which, you know, I'm glad they did because now it's really great to identify them from <laughs> photographs, but you know, it turned out that that was really great for the Japanese too. And almost all the gunboats received holes in their bowels, right where these giant numbers were. It gave them a, a not a only a giant number, but a giant bright white number. Bright, it wasn't giant, it wasn't like white, no. dark gray on top of a gray battleship no it was a bright white bright bright, bright white eggshell white probably yep. even glossy not even a matte finish <laughs> on top of a gray <laughs> but let's let's pause for a second you, you kind of talked about how due to our pre-landing reconnaissance we had the whole island gridded out 
for our artillery, but also we had the measurements. And I don't know, I'm not a battlefield planner, but I'm assuming when we plan an invasion, especially of an island, the amount of manpower we choose to send out there probably equates with the amount of personnel we think is there times the size of the island in which we're trying to take over, right? The bigger the island, I would assume, the more manpower we're going to probably throw at the problem. The smaller the island, probably less, because uh, clearly the smaller the island, you only have physically so much room for people, right? And so Iwo Jima is roughly about eight square miles. And so we're like, okay, so eight square miles. Let's have, I think we sent 80,000 landing troops out there. But once again, what we didn't plan, they had 16 miles worth of tunnels in Mount Suribachi. They essentially took an eight square mile island and made it 24 miles. And so we're planning this attack on this island thinking, okay, it's eight square miles. There's going to be X amount of troops. Little did we realize they had 16 miles of tunnels and bunker systems dug into Mount Suribachi. And you want to talk about, oh, wow, damn, we didn't know until later that our calculations were a bit off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and, and there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to go up to each entrance and you got to blow them. You got to seal them up. And that was... That was a staggering realization for those Marines. The thing we had on our side, though, is they were cut off. It was kind of like our equivalent of, or their equivalent of our Wake Island, but just a hell of a lot bigger. They had the mm -hmm. Navy, their Navy had been sent off to fight at Okinawa. And so they had no Navy. They had no air cover. They had no promise of reinforcements. What they had on that island, they had on that island. And as you said, we surrounded it. We were locked in and ready to go. It was just locked in. And so it was hard. It was long. But I mean, it could have been a hell of a lot worse shoes. if they had their Navy coming in from behind. And if we had a full-scale Navy battle on top of what we we're trying to do on that oh, island, yeah. that would have been a completely different war. Yeah. And, and you know, fortunately, the Marianas Turkey shoot had happened a little bit before then. So all those resources, Japanese resources that they had put into that, you know, was just evaporated. But uh, I mean, you know, on the 19th, I mean, the 17th of February, you know, the the Japanese who 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 did survive, um, very few of them, but the few who did survive, would would said that they were impressed with the invasion fleet. <laughs> it's the 17th of February, <laughs> and it's like, man, wait a minute, that that wait till the 19th. <laughs> it's like, so they you know they thought, wow, this is impressive, and then on the 19th, you know, the the skies. The uh, the sun comes up and reveals just the pure might of what Yamamoto was talking about, about what the capabilities of this amazing uh, country. And, and once those gears were engaged for the, uh, you know, industry and all that, it was just crazy. So we had 495 ships on the 19th. How many did we roughly have on the 17th? How many were there for the pre-invasion speculation and you know planning so you had 12 gunboats of flotilla three the lci gunboats you got 12 of those um that one included uh flotilla three's uh flagship the 627 uh mad mike melanophy commander man if he was on there um then you have the uss estes um then you've got the uh uss terror which is a minesweeper um you have a the Destroyer, the Williamson, that is a, a fl sea float uh, tender, um, a seaplane tender. Uh, it was just refueling them from the cruisers and this and that as they were. So, um, you know, you've got uh, the Pensacola, you've got um, the Tennessee, the Nevada, the Texas, um, the battleships. Um, and then you've got uh, the minesweepers. Um, I think there was six or seven of those. Then you've got the destroyer. You've got uh, the lutes, the hull, the twigs, uh, Paul Hamilton, I want to say. There was about eight or nine of uh, the destroyers that were there. So we're roughly about um, 60 right now. I mean, I, was, I, I yeah. counted off 32, but when you said destroyers, we didn't have a number. So then we'll round up, yeah. say about 40, 50-ish. So, yeah. Yeah. The only difference of about... 
420 shots. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> On the 17th, you know, the Japanese thought, oh, wow, this is the invasion. <laughs> and they see these 12 gunboats coming in, and they think, well, this is these, these are landing craft. This is it. And then on the 19th, <laughs> my goodness. Could you imagine Bizarro Land in the future? You have a Japanese survivor of Iwo Jima, and you have a German survivor of D-Day, and they're drunk oh, arguing man. over who saw the bigger invading <laughs> fleet and how scary it was. Because, I mean, essentially, that I mean, at that numbers, using the naked eye, that is literally as far as the eye can see. It's just... I, I can't even imagine. I mean, just, oh, no. yeah, this is going to suck. <laughs> we woke yeah. sleep and die for sure. And, and, and Don, you know, just a little, what, what's really impressive when you think about it is that while they're, we're doing that on D-Day at Normandy, at, at the very same time on the other side of the globe, we have just as big a fleet heading towards the Marianas. To, to land at uh, Saipan on June 15th. I mean, <laughs> just the that capability to put that much force across the planet, I mean, at the same time, that's... We could have never not, done it. Even if we the did. logistics, fueling and food and mail and yeah. just pulling all that off. If we didn't have Detroit, Pennsylvania, um, all those manufacturing areas, yeah. Chicago... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, imagine if, imagine how different the world would be right now if in 1939, or let's re rewind even further, by 1929, we had outsourced all our manufacturing to all, I don't know, China like we did today. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that's why I, I kind of snicker and laugh to myself when I hear modern day people say oh we're just going to get in the war because they want to boost the economy it's like no we don't have the manufacturing here like we did in world war ii it's no. not gonna it's not gonna have the same effect those, those are old arguments i'm not saying we don't have a military industrial complex i'm just saying we don't have the the manufacturing at that level to output what we did back then and i mean when you have g you know ge and westinghouse and people going from making refrigerators and fans to just pumping out, you know, even GM was making grease guns and just everything. It's just, yeah, literally we retooled every, I mean, what was it? I think 19, what was the last automobile model that you can get until after the war was like a 1939, 1941, like Packard or something. Yeah. And then you couldn't, there was no more cars until like 1946 or until yeah. 1945. And of course that's when all the, <laughs> All the veterans came back, and that's when all the big wings, 1950s, all the big wings started showing up on the back of their cars because these guys are ex-pilots. And like, oh, I want a car that looks like the, the planes I used to fly. And then, of course, we hit the rocket age, and everything else goes from there. Oh. You know, there was a video game, um, Medal of Honor, Call of Duty. Uh, they actually, uh, there was a video game, they, they did Peloton. Yep. And World War. in one of the scenes, the opening scenes, you get to be on an LCI gunboat and you would walk in some uh, rockets. And uh, that was I was like, man, somebody really did their homework. That was pretty cool. Yeah, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, I Obviously, I played that before the Pacific came out and go back and play. And it's, it's unplayable now, especially multiplayer, because all the hackers are out there. I don't even think the servers are up anymore. But like if you go back and do the airfield after watching the Pacific, it's not as wide on there, but they had the, the bunker looks exactly the same. You have a smaller version of the air, airfield you run across. The other cool thing on the campaign mode on that is you got to be in a um, PBY rescuing uh, pilots and sailors out of the water. So you'd run from one end oh, of the PBI on the right. gunboat and you'd run, open yeah. up the hatch and pull the sailors in. And you had to climb back through in first person. Yeah. yeah so you got to do the PBY on that. Um, you got to do the bonsai charges. And then you got to do the Russian stuff. And straight out of the movie Enemy at the Gates, remember that movie? Yeah, absolutely. Well, they recreated the scene where um, they're, you're laying in the, the, the defunct um, wishing well. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you see the German uh, officer taking a shower and you're plinking them with the rifle. They recreated that entire scene out of the movie in that game. So you got to recreate that scene in the game. That was a very, very cool um version of that game and then all the rest of them went downhill from there 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I put so much uh, effort into the detail and the uh, environments. I mean, it was groundbreaking. It was really uh, tremendous. And it gave that resurgence of, I mean, it was pretty cool because now all of a sudden there was these, you know, these middle schoolers and whatnot talking about MG42s and, you know, and it well, was it was pretty cool. And that was one of the first World War II themed video games that did not take place in Europe. You had the mm. medal, the original Medal of Honor, which came out around 2000, 99. No, it came around 1998, 99, because that was right after Saving Private Ryan. They had the, the D-Day landing experience. And then you had um, Hell's Highway, which was an airborne, um, you know, game. And then you had, obviously, you had the bombing games on Illinois. But I remember back in the day, like, six-bit graphics had... Uh, B-17 bomber game, which was horrible graphics. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think World at War was probably one of the – if it wasn't the first Marine Corps game, it was definitely one of the first where you played as the Russians. I can't think of another game that included the Russians' um, contribution to the war effort, good or bad. But, yeah. Right. I did definitely... Well, it was really – I mean, that game, World at War, was – especially if you were lucky enough to have surround sound, I mean – you were immersed in there, and out of the jungle, you just hear, you know, you're going to die, you're a Marine, you know. <laughs> cool thing about and, not uh, being live, I can do things like this. Hold on. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> Had to go to the closet for this. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Wow. What's all in there? A, re- a little replica of a Japanese uh, canteen that uh, has oh. Call of Duty etched on it. That is cool. That was the collector's edition. And that then, is awesome. I have already sold it, but when um, Modern Warfare 2 came out, I, I used to be heavy into video games, and Carrie and I stopped playing them because that's all we would do. And then I got real bad carpal tunnel syndrome, and we both gained like 40 pounds. I actually had the Modern Warfare 2 with the night vision goggles. Oh, man. So I ended up selling those, <laughs> but yeah. Um, that is a cool, what a great gift set. Yeah, that is a, pretty awesome. It's a nice metal box. How would it, how, I haven't played the game in a long time. How does it hold up? I haven't played the game either because it's not backwards compatible. This is for the Xbox 360. I tried playing it a couple years back on multiplayer, but the hackers were full whole hog. Like, all you saw was text streaming of, like, YouTube channels, and people were in God mode. You couldn't kill them. It was just – and to me, it was frustrating because they were still actively selling the game. It's like, look, I get it. The game's old. You're not going to manage the server. But when I go down to Walmart and drop $40 for this game, I shouldn't go home and not be able to play it because there's hackers on there. There's people running God mode. There's just – text scripts, YouTube URLs going across the screen. It's like, Jeez. how are you still selling this game if you're not going to maintain the servers? But, yeah, that's been years. So, yeah, this was, this was the uh, World at War Day 1 Activision Limited Collecting Edition. So it's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, and what, what game was – is that World at War where, where you were the, the Russian mob rushing forward, charging? Yeah. And it was just thousands, and you could actually feel it. You actually felt – yeah, and just like, like out of the, the movie, anxiety, it was, like, it was oh and, and, they, and they did the realist part, too. Like, I think your person was like, here's some stripper clips. If he dies, you grab his gun. <laughs> so right, you just start running, right. and he gets shot, and you got to pick up his gun. <laughs> and you just hear all this yelling and this flags, and you're just rushing, like, just mayhem. It was... <laughs> that one, you, the, the campaign starts out on Macon, and Kiefer Sutherland's doing the, um, the narration. And that's mm. also the first time, if you're not a World War II aficionado, that's the first time you're introduced to Frog Camo. Because the game opens up, you're you're a prisoner. I can't believe we're we're doing a, we're doing a podcast on a fifteen year old video game, but it's 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 definitely <laughs> cool. So the game starts, it's the screen's black and they remove a, a hood and you're a prisoner on making a toll. And you got your hands behind you, and you see the Japanese commander cut the head off of your co- your your comrade. You look over, and he cuts the head off of one of the Marines. And then, as he's getting ready to cut your head off, he gets shot in the head. And they come and rescue you, and you hand a gun, and you're running through you know 
making a toll with the Japanese coming out there. And basically, oh. at the end of the map, you get on some, um, were they called Zephyr boats back then? I'm not sure. The rubber raft. The, the, yeah. The, yeah, you get on those and you take off and you get to a submarine. And then um, the cool thing about that one is in, in between the, on the campaign mode, it was actually educational. So while you're waiting for the game to load, they would, they would a little movieette would come on and they would show real yeah. footage. And Kiefer Sutherland once again was doing the narration, and they're talking about Bougainville and they're showing the famous clips of the guys walking in the mud, shaving, and all the tanks sinking. And so you go through the whole campaign. I still they have my Xbox 360. I have my 360 at my garage. I need to replay this campaign mode or see if it'll. Every once in a while, some of the bigger platforms you can do backwards compatibility by loading it into your new Xbox. But yeah, yeah I've got my old 360 sitting over there and my uh, newer one, Xbox One. Actually, you know, I didn't even look to see if the damn game's still in here. I have envelopes in here from where I had currency and stuff. Um, no, I think the game's out in my garage. Yeah, because I got a bunch of World War II. Yeah, stuff you got me here. curious now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go see if I can. I'm, I'm, I know I've got it. I definitely have it. So back to the story at hand. <laughs> Iwo Jima. <laughs> so what was the overall roughly casualties that the LCI gun crews fell to um, by the time that the primary invasion was over? Yeah, so you had your, your first initial wave was seven gunboats. Now, mind you, they, they're not expecting hardly anything to happen uh, they hadn't never before had the japanese opened up like that on any of the islands um and for this you know particular recon missions and so you know they go in and they're but they're ready you know, they're out with their guns and they're practice well practiced they've done it before um and then all of a sudden they just start taking hits and they they send in the relief gunboats, um, the 466 and the 469 and the 471. They get sent in. And I, I, I interviewed Larry Hermes, who was an officer, ensign uh, officer on the 471 gunboat. And his was, he said, when I, he, was, he was going in, he was passing uh, ammunition to the, the, the uh, 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 guns on the, uh, the 40 millimeters there. And uh, he, he looked over and he saw my grandpa's gunboat and the mast had been blown off by that time. And uh, already they had, you know, 20, 20 guys killed and 20 wounded. So that was 60% of the crew. So he said when he looked over that, that he didn't see anybody topside at all, but he did see one guy. He, he said, I did see one guy and he was hunched over walking from the bow of the ship towards the rear hunched over and there was flames and he thought my god we are in for it but so the 471 ended up having um several guys killed as well and wounded but total uh, casualties uh, they had about 54 guys killed out of this group of about 700 sailors uh 54 of them killed and 150 wounded um and when you think about I mean, that's a significant number. <laughs> yeah. That's a significant number of guys. They had uh, 12 Navy crosses awarded, one Medal of Honor, uh, dozens of bronze and silver stars, presidential unit citation for the group. Um, the, the commander of the, of the frogman, B. Hall Handlin, uh, he, he actually made a request in his report, and he recommended that one of the radio transmissions he heard from the gunboats, he recommended that it be put in the famous quotes of all time for the Navy to be there with damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. And the quote was from one of the gunboats said uh, over the radio said fires under control request permission to return to the line. Wow. And he, he was just so moved because he said that it wasn't like fires extinguished damage is taken care of request permission to return. It was fires under control requests permission to return and they they wanted to get back in there and protect the frogmen which was their job and there wasn't a, a frogman in the water not one was lost and um actually there was one and then one of the officers who died was lee carlton yates uh underwater demolition team 14 
uh, he was an observer on my grandpa's gunboat, the 449. Uh, he, he was killed. Now, I'm looking at a few LCIs on, on the uh, Internet. I did find the 471. Um, yeah, I see the two you're referring to, the two different models. Like the 691 has the opening front with the ramp that mm -hmm. comes out of the center, but I'm looking at like 326, and it has basically two gangplanks come down, one on each side off the front That's of the right. boat. These little flimsy ladders, these flimsy uh, ramps that would come out. With absolutely yeah. no damn protection at all. So not None. only are you coming down the side, these ramps off the front, but you're, line, you're queued up along the side of the boat with absolutely no protection. There's no gun None. walls. There's no and, armor. And, and they found at, at Omaha Beach, the, the waves knocked several of the ramps uh, cockeyed and, and sideways and took them off Kelt, off Kelter and they they they, had, they weren't able to use it so they had to go the other side they couldn't, and it was a big uh, congestion and the 88s are coming in and hitting into the troop compartments and you know in one in particular the 88 shell blew up in the uh, troop compartment it was full and those 50 guys died in there I mean they didn't even make it to the beach and they died right in there just roasted alive I mean and, a, a well placed machine gun could take out an entire row of guys oh, lined yeah, up on the side absolutely. of the side absolutely there's no Just protection. Single There's, file. You figure they would have put some sort of steel plating for them while waiting to get to the ramp. I mean, it's one thing to be on the ramp, but when you're you're the last guy in line waiting to go down, you're literally exposed. <laughs> that's Just, a long. That's an eternity. Yeah, I mean, and it, get this: the first guy is the first guy down the ramp is the sailor from the LCI, and he runs a rope. <laughs> His job. He runs a rope up to the beach and sits down on the beach and holds the rope. That the soldiers then get to use to hold on to when they're crossing the water. Did grip tape exist <laughs> back then? Did we have grip tape as we know it? I'm not sure. That's a good question. Because I like I know when I did the yeah. Tarawa event, we had a um, Higgins boat out there. Those ramps are slippery as hell, and yeah, I'm sure that ramp. Yeah, gr granted, a majority of that ramp's not in the in the water per se. But when you're coming in, you got artillery fire, water splashing all over the place, and you're running down with imagine being a mortar guy or a machine gunner and you're carrying yeah. those tripods as ammo and you're just running down either wet wood or wet steel in some go rubber to, shoes um, go to navsource.org what is it nav navsource n-a-v-s-o-u-r-c-e navsource.org mm -hmm. and let me know when you're there apparently i was just okay and then click on amphibious mm -mm 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 -mm. Trying to find it. Battleships, aircraft carriers, submarines, auxiliary, amphibious. I figure they're putting that boat quarter, but here we are. Um, All right. And, LC then, and then go to LCI. LCI landing craft, landing craft infantry. infantry. Yep. All right. And then you, th this is a tremendous site for anybody out there. Um, and then you, you can click on, go to number 85. 85, 23. 64, 82, 85. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's some photos on there that are, are just from Omaha. They, they're just, um, the 85 was sunk, but wow. they, that, that's a really. For, for those of you following along at home, when you think of these LCIs, you're just thinking of this, at least I did until seeing this particular photo, you're just thinking of a, a vessel with a big open center that the guys are just chilling in. No, there's gun turrets and everything else. These guys are literally sitting along the, the railing of these vessels for <laughs> long periods of time. I mean, it's not like there's, you know, I guess some of them have open holes. Yeah, there's a few of them like have, okay, so the front has some open hole, but the back has all the all the guns. And so, yeah. Yeah, and in that particular, I think there's a picture of the eight, on the 85 there. It shows um a, a photo looking down on it from a larger ship um, because they hit a mine yeah. and they were going down but they had already taken a lot of, of hits from machine guns and whatnot and you'll see dead soldiers splayed out on the deck oh um, yeah i think yep looking at it right their now. faces had been removed um by uh razor uh th through the negatives on the photographs unfortunately yeah. but um yeah, and, and that one, and then like the 91, the 92, the 93, 94, um, those were all Coast Guard. 
and they um, Coast Guard LCIs that were there at Omaha Beach, and they were all burned, um, left on the beach. They they were high and dry. Um, but you know that's just part of the of the Normandy that doesn't really get told very much. You know it's interesting, and in, in either on this episode or the next episode, depending on how the editing goes, um, depending on content, as we play these clips um, from Mr. Robert Glenn, he's talking about when he landed on Ewo, they had basically he was not the first, second, or fifth landing, but he was at the time his crew landed, they had already intentionally ran to ships to aground to basically create a impromptu line of protection so they would bring the landing craft up in between these two vessels so mm. that it would protect them from side attacks. Obviously, they still had to head on machine gun fire, but it did allow for some protection of them while they're disembarking, at least until they cleared the protection provided by these ships. But they, with these two, I don't know if they did intentionally or just happenstance, but what they figured out with these two ve- uh, these ships ran aground they could pull in between them and, and get a little bit of cover at least while they're within that certain range and so that did help provide some protection as well yeah there's some great pictures that i scanned at the archives in dc of uh, iwo jima the lci 347 um, this was after this was after the invasion had already taken place but they they would you know when they were going up to the beach they would drop their stern anchor and they would let it run out and then they would ram like you just what you're saying they would ram them ashore and um what they would do then is they would winch themselves off and they would just reverse engines and then pull on the anchor and they'd pull themselves off sometimes it didn't work but you know, yeah. usually they did well the best well plans only is good until boots hit the ground and you just kind of make things up as you go along yeah absolutely yeah. but that you know that because of the the damage that a flotilla three took you know on the e one that recon mission um they're not in the photographs on the 19th of february and that's uh one of the startling things from uh, the research when i first started doing it was to discover that my grandpa's unit was the gunboats were actually slated to do what they had done for all the other invasions and that was precede the marine waves on on the invasion day precede them with rows and walls of rockets and uh but they weren't available because they had been wiped out on the 17th and all of those invasion pictures from the 19th they do have uh, uh, the uh, gunboats but they're not lcis they're lcs and um which was also a testament to how much we had that we could just lcf until three had been wiped out on the 19th so let's pull the lcs guys in there I was going to ask you earlier, how much do you know about the frogmen themselves as far as gear, equipment? Yeah, gear and equipment, n- not too much. I, I I know that they would, they would uh, on their bodies, they would put the paint. They thought that would p- provide a layer of <laughs> thermal well, I protection. Just, I, I don't think they had personal air devices back then yet, right? We no, didn't have, no, yes. they no, so they didn't. So they're, pri- pri- they're pretty, primarily snorkeling, right? Yeah. So the not even of, that, just just with nice face mask and holding your breath, just holding your breath and going. And they had, like I said, they had those grease pens, grease pencils with the uh, charts that were uh, on their thighs. They did try at Saipan Invasion. They tried what they called the, a floating mattress. <laughs> they, they, they had to call the floating mattress and they put a small little engine on it. And they tried to use it because it was low profile. Right. And so, but the thing kept kept uh, shorting out, and then it kept electrocuting really bad. It was electrocuting the the frogmen <laughs> as they were trying to oh, get ashore. Shit. So they they just let it sink. They were like, "Forget this thing. This thing's gonna kill us." I'll have to email you this because I googled, you know, uh, equipment frogmen equipment World War Two, and just at this real time, don't have time to read a ten page document. But I just came across this PDF that was made. <laughs> It was declassified in 1979. Um, unclassified, the Naval Intelligence Intelligence Support Center Translation Division. Ooh, this may not. This may be about. Ooh, this looks like German. 
technical uh, dare comp. Yeah, so this looks like this is a report on maybe the German Navy's equipment that came out and that was declassified in 1980. Yeah, diving mask, diving suits. Here are wet diving suits or dry diving suits. Yeah, so I might we'll have to check this out and see. It's making reference to Germany, so I don't know if this is. Let's see here. Technical resources for the frogmen of the capitalist navies. Maybe this is German. Maybe this is a German uh, document oh, like they had on American report. navies. Because why would they put capitalist navy? So I wonder if this is a. Capitalist. I wonder if this is a navy. Tra I wonder if this is American translation. Yeah, here we go. Sure. Uh, translated by Joseph Krabs. Source. Uh, Militarnik, June 1979, German. So this looks like a declassified translation of maybe what the Germans had on our equipment. So this would be pretty interesting to check out. Individual life-saving apparatus. Life-saving apparatus, apparatus consisted of an indispensable component of equipment for a frogman. Life-saving apparatuses are made of impregnable materials like life jackets. So this might be pretty cool to look over at a later date and time. But yeah, maybe that's something we need to... Do an episode on it too. Maybe one of yeah. us will do a deep dive on the equipment because that's one of the things that always, you know, obviously the further we get from 1940, the more rudimentary. But some of the stuff's even by today's standards is still like, eh, still relatively advanced. But it's surprising how. For example, I'm looking up and I see I got a um, invasion vest up here. That back then, height of technology. Nowadays, you're like, wow, that's a life-saving device that was basically inflated by my kid's CO2 cartridge out of his Daisy BB gun. <laughs> <laughs> you're old enough to remember. Remember we used to make those uh, model rockets when we were kids? Yeah. You put the uh, you put the, the little Y wire in there that had the little brown tape, and then you put the two alligator clips, 30-foot, yeah. and you had 9-volt battery. You know where the technology of those rocket engines came from? Where? You ever see how a bazooka Crap. works? Oh, uh. Remember in uh, remember Band of Brothers when he's he's got the bazooka and there I think it's um I don't know if it's Breakcore Manor or no I think it's Holland. Anyhow, that's when they're all in the field and they're and the the Germans are coming through and he's he's back there fiddling with the rocket. You know how bazookas worked? How's that? Put a rocket in there. Has a little V metal. Two alligator clips. Wooden handle with a trigger that activates <laughs> a 9-volt battery. So basically, after the war, we had these manufacturing <laughs> plants saying, what are we going to do with all these rocket engines? That checks I out. know. <laughs> Let's make kid toys. So basically, the <laughs> I'm sure they weren't as powerful, but basically, we were making rockets out of pretty much bazooka because <laughs> they, they literally worked the same <laughs> that, way that was they in worked... the that was in, that those came from the bin right next to the lawn darts mm -hmm. <laughs> another great idea <laughs> and um i don't know plus shot rounds you know be interesting so for young cats these these were little engine they were basically a cardboard tube and they had a flammable it, it kind of looked like a white or gray Almost like cement. It would crumble out of there if you took a screwdriver or something in there. And you basically put this little piece of metal that split in a Y, and the 9-volt would complete the circuit. It would heat up, detonate the rocket. But when it got to a certain point, it had a reverse rocket on it, which put out just enough compression to pop the parachute out of the top of your rocket so that it slowly drifted. I don't know if the bazooka engines originally had the reverse rocket. Maybe that's what caused I don't know. That'd be interesting to hmm. see if the reverse aspect That's of wild. that engine was engineered specifically for the use of model rockets. So, you know, yeah, you had like the dollar fifty ones, but just like anything else, you had the I'm a college kid, I'm a nerd. This is 1979, 1983. I'm going to spend eight months building an exact replica of the rockets that sent, you know, Apollo 7 <laughs> to space. And so. <laughs> When you're spending this time and money on a high-end rocket, you you wanted that parachute. You didn't just want the whole thing to plump to the ground. And so you needed that reverse engine to cause the top to pop off and deploy your parachute. But it had to be weak enough that it didn't catch the damn thing on fire. And so I don't know if the reverse part of that was – I would imagine it was engineered specifically for 
the model rocket industry. But the rocket itself, I, it's, I haven't confirmed this, but after seeing a, a bazooka in real life and seeing, oh, there's just a button that goes to a 9-volt and there's wires. <laughs> I was like, that's what they're doing in the back. That's why he needed the second guy back there. It was more than just to put the rocket in there. He was hooking up the electrodes to, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I think that's going to you know, wrap it up for this episode, episode one on Iwo Jima. We're going to get a little more deep dive into the actual landing and the battle itself when Jeff joins us on next week's episode. And so I want to thank each and every one of you for your continued support of the What's the Scuttlebutt podcast. We will be back next week on the 19th with part two and the actual landing and the battle itself. Thank you so much, Dennis, for your um, knowledge and bringing us more detail about the pre-invasion landing and the LCIs and the gun crews who are responsible, the frogmen, the pre-invasion development and planning that went into this. Thank you so much for that great detail. Thank you all, and we will talk to everybody next week. This has been a Digital 410 production. <laughs>